Hello and welcome back to Chant Talk. This is episode 5 and I'm your host Patrick Torsel, the music director at Mater Dei Latin Mass Community in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Check it out. It's a beautiful parish. We've got lots of wonderful things happening in the parish and especially with the music department. Today I wanted to cover three questions that you, the viewers, had posed to me over the last uh, handful of months. Um, the question which came from the traditional altar boy was about psalm tone accompaniment and how to, how to do that. So we'll take a look at that. And then Christian asked about pedaling technique with chant. So we'll take a look at pedaling. Uh, and Peter asked about basic reading of chant notation uh, to kind of build the foundation for all the other things we've talked about and we'll continue to talk about. Well, Peter, that's a big topic. Um, and I am going to go ahead and try to tackle it right now in less than five minutes. So this is going to be your crash course on reading chant notation. I will put links below to some uh, more detailed information that's already been produced out there in the ether. Uh, but for our purposes, here's your crash course. When you're looking at a Gregorian chant score, you see the staff. It's a four-line staff. There's those four lines stacked on each other. The staff, uh, as far as we know, was invented by a monk uh, named Guido of Arezzo, and he wanted to come up with a system of writing out chants so that we knew uh, wh which pitch was which. Uh, previous notations um, had the, the neumes, the, the groupings of notes, just written up above the words without um, any direct indication of which pitch to sing. But by putting them on the staff, you can determine exactly which pitch to sing. So that's where we ended up with the staff. And on the four-line staff, we have to be able to figure out which pitch is which. And we do that by means of a small symbol called a clef. And in Gregorian chant, there are two types of clef, the do clef and the fa clef. Now when we say do and fa, we're talking about the traditional syllables. Do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, ti, la, so, fa, mi, re, do. And so the do clef shows you where do is. Whichever line the do clef is on, that's do. You normally see it on the first line, uh, the top line, the line below the top line, and sometimes the third line down. We also have the fa clef, and the fa clef uh, does exactly what it sounds like it does. It shows you where to find fa, and it's usually on one of the middle two lines. Now the reason that we have these different clefs instead of just one clef is so that it's easier to read the notation. Uh, certain modes have, each mode has a particular range, and by being able to choose the appropriate clef, you can keep most of the notated music for that mode within the confines of the staff, rather than having to have many ledger lines above or below the staff in order to notate it. So it's just a matter of being able to keep it visually easy to read and to comprehend. And once we can figure out what's what, we know where do is or we know where fa is, then we can figure out what each of the other pitches is on the staff, because each line in each space is a syllable. So if we have do clef on the top line, we can start from there and work our way down. Do, ti, la, so, fa, mi, re, do. And those are our notes on the staff, easy enough to figure out. And in Gregorian chant, we talk about what we call movable do. It's different from movable do in modern music, and we're not even going to get into that. But movable do in Gregorian chant just means that do can be on any pitch. Do does not have to be C like we would think of do in modern music. Do can be anything. Do can be F, do can be A flat, do can be C sharp, whatever. It doesn't matter. It's a matter of setting do in a spot where it's comfortable to sing the particular chant. So that's how that works. Now once we've got that figured out, we have to figure out what the little symbols actually mean for the notes. And the basic note in Gregorian chant is the punctum. It's just the little square note. And the punctum is worth one beat. And if you put a little dot beside the punctum, now it's worth two beats, and that's called <laughs> a dotted punctum. We also have the virgo, which is a single beat neum. Works the same way as a punctum, but it has a, a, a little flag on it. In our two-note neums, we commonly see the podatus. That's where you have two punctums stacked on top of each other, and you sing the bottom note first. Then we have the clevis, uh, which is interpreted exactly how it looks. Top note first, uh, and then the second note is lower. Climacus is a three-note descending neum, works basically just like the, uh, the clevis, except it's three notes, and it's notated with the first note as a punctum and the second two uh, as a rhombus. That's that, that little diamond-shaped note. <clears throat> Each one is just worth one beat. The scondicus is a three-note ascending neum. So is the solicus, but the solicus always has the ictus, which is that little vertical line, always has the ictus on the second note. And the, what the ictus tells you, that vertical line, it tells you where beat one is. We know in Gregorian chant that our rhythmic patterns are always groupings of two beats or three beats. 
but you've got to be able to know where beat one is. And there's a whole series of rules about how to figure it out when, it, when there's not a written ictus, but for now, just know that when you see a written ictus, it means that's beat one. Now, the solicus is interesting. Uh, if you look at, at the interpretation of it through the years, um, Many people will interpret that as the ictic note, the second note, is an elongated note. They, it's called uh, sung expressively. There's a difference of opinion about this. Um, it doesn't have to be sung expressively. There's there's semiological reason, I, I guess, to believe that, that it's not. It, for, for now, don't worry about that. Just know that um, some schools do interpret the ictic note as expressive and sung uh, held out a little bit longer, and, and some don't. In our uh, next three note noon, we have the torcolus. It's a lower note than a higher note than a lower note again. And finally, we have the uh, quilisma, and that's where it's a three note ascending noon, but the middle note looks jagged. And again, there's, there's a difference of opinion about how these are interpreted, but generally speaking, we can say that the first note of a quilisma, the bottom note, is sung expressively, again, held a little bit longer. And then the jagged section, that's actually a note, you sing that, and then you sing the top, the top note. So um, the quilisma, we'll hold out the bottom note and then sing the next two. Uh, a couple of other, there are, by the way, there are more nooms than that, but those are the basic ones you're going to see most often. There are four note constructions and, and, and some other ones, but, but those are the, the primary ones to know. Some other things to pay attention to, whenever you see a, a horizontal line over a note or a group of notes, that is called an episema, a horizontal episema, and it means to sing that note or those notes expressively or to hold them a little bit longer. This is not a very scientific thing. It's not two beats, but it's more than one beat. So it's kind of a beat and a half-ish. You just hold it out, you express it a little bit more, but don't hang on to it for two full beats or, or more. I've heard people sing these episemas out for three beats each. Don't, don't do that. Make sure that each, uh, each note that has an episema over it is sung just a little bit longer than one beat. Okay, And then we have uh, one more sy uh, symbol to talk about, and that's the kustos, which is the little tiny symbol at the end of a line of Gregorian chant. And the, what the kustos tells you is uh, the next note you're going to sing on the next line below. It's just one of those helpful tools as you're singing along and kind of getting in your groove. You can look at that kustos and know what your next note is going to be on the next line. Okay, and that's it. In a nutshell, that's how you read Gregorian chant. Take a look at the uh, links below if you want some more detail on that. And now let's head uh, to the organ and talk a little bit about psalm tones and pedaling. Okay, so when we're talking about psalm tones, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, number one, you may have a flex. And the flex is, is a movement within the, the first part of the psalm tone, and you can find it uh, where it's usually notated with a little um, kind of like an apostrophe sign, so keep an eye out for those. Um, in each mode, uh, the, the flex is treated in a particular way. And we also want to watch out for which termination that our psalm tone is going to use, and you find the termination usually um, written with your antiphon, or maybe notated with your, your psalm tone. In this case, for example, I, I just printed out Sunday Vespers here. In the first antiphons in mode C, uh, yeah. in mode 7, and the termination is C2. It's important to know because each mode has a, a variety of possible terminations, and if you want to kind of look at that in more depth, if you go to the Liber Usualis, um, at least in this edition, it was pages 113 through 117, you can see how the modes are actually technically constructed and you'll have the whole list of terminations that each mode could have. So those are good to, to familiarize yourself with. Okay, um, We have to pick a, uh, what's called a reciting tone for our, uh, our psalm tones. And typically speaking, we're going to find that um, A is the most comfortable note to recite a psalm on. You don't have to do it there. It could be B flat, it could be A flat, it could be C, whatever. Uh, but I've always found A to be the most comfortable reciting tone, so that's where we're going to put it today. Another thing to keep in mind, um, with all Gregorian chant accompaniment, but especially with psalm tone accompaniment, is keep it simple. Very basic, very minimalist, just a nice, uh, a nice cushion almost to sing over top of, if that, if that kind of visually makes some sense. Um, we don't want the, the organ accompaniment to become intrusive in especially in psalm tones. Okay. Um, so I thought we would just take a look at the briefly at the psalms of Sunday Vespers. It's a good, a good smattering of different psalm tones that we can take a look at. And um, you know the, what I'm going to show you here would apply to any use of psalm tones, whether it's uh, in the context of the Rossini propers 
or whether it's in the context of applying a psalm tone uh, at the responsorial psalm in a novus ordo, or whether it's looking at uh, something like Vespers for the extraordinary form like this. So uh, the first antiphon and psalm tone of Sunday, as we already saw, is in mode 7 with the C termination. Okay, and our reciting tone is on A, and in this case, because we have, um, it recites on Re, Re is actually A, so Do is G, okay? And so when you're playing a psalm tone, often a cantor will intone the first time around, so you can give him his pitch or the intonation. And he might sing, Dixit Dominus Domino Meo, chord and then E minor that's that's really it okay so um, second verse what did I do there just D A minor first inversion G major and back to D major E minor that's it that's that's the chords you're going to use there Nice and simple, nice and soft. Let me uh, just sing along a couple verses with that so you can hear how it sounds in practice. Dixit Dominus Domino Meo, Sere ad extris meis, Donec bonamini micos tuos, Sobelum perum tu oro, Virgam virtutis tui emitet Dominus ex. trying to figure out timing can be a little bit tricky and it depends on how the singers are doing it. In a perfect world hopefully they'll keep a relatively even tempo. Um, personally when I'm singing a syllabic chant like this I like to uh, put a bit more emphasis on the, the, the word accent. Not everybody does that. Uh, frequently if you're in a choir, a clerical choir setting, you'll have a, long, a longer pause at the asterisk in the middle of a verse than between verses, because in the alternatum between the two sides of the, uh, the clerical choir, uh, they often will attack the next verse very quickly, but then at the asterisk there will be a bit more of a pause. So, for example, in the fourth verse here, we might hear, Tecum principium in die virtutis tui in splendoribus sanctorum, ex vutero ante luciferum so the next side might jump in real quick. So you have to just be listening and paying attention. And this is one of those cases where the organ is not leading. The organ may be necessary for some people to find their pitches, but the organ is typically not leading in psalm tones. The organ is following and supporting. So listen to what your choir is doing or pay attention to your director uh, and follow that way. You can lead by making sure they're staying on key, but follow their interpretation. Okay, let's move on and look at the next one. So the second antiphon, or the second uh, psalm, sorry, uh, for Sunday is in mode three with termination B. Okay, so we would give the intonation. Confite tibi domine in toto corde meo in concilio justorum et congregatione magna so what am I doing? I'm starting on an A major. And then I'm going to F sharp minor. And D major. E major. That's it. That's how that one uh, comes together. Um, there are some, some flexes here. Um, in this case, indicated with a little, uh, actually a little cross sign. I had, had mentioned the apostrophe earlier, but in the middle of a psalm verse, I'm reminded now that, that you find a little cross to tell you where the flex point is. Okay, so uh, let's look at that. Verse 4 has the flex. Let's see how that works, because the flex goes down to a, um, uh, to la, F sharp in this case. So, memorium fecit mirabilium suorum, F sharp minor, then back up to the A. Misericors et miserator dominus, escanteritimentibus, and so on and so forth. Um, if you 
you're wondering how to know where to move, uh, generally speaking, hopefully in whatever you're looking at, it's going to embolden or italicize certain syllables of the words which tell you where to move. For example, on verse 5, Memorarit in seculum testamenti. The men of uh, menti is boldened. Mm -hmm. And then virtutem opunum suorum annunciabit populo suo. Uh, suo, sorry, I sang the wrong ending. But uh, populo is italicized. Suo. And that's it, okay? So that's uh, mode 3, termination B. How about, uh, here we go, the next one is mode 4, termination G. I like mode 4. So, uh, again, reciting tone to sting right on A, <clears throat> which means we're back in kind of concert pitch, if you will. So, La is A. Beatus verquitim et dominum In mandati seus volet this one's, this one's pretty simple as well. It's just A minor and E minor that are going to come out here. And that's just that, that suspension there, 2 and 3, back up to 4 and 5, right? Might go up to the first inversion of uh, A minor. Okay, let me just do another verse or two. You know, psalm tones, keep them simple. Find your reciting tone that's comfortable, usually A. Make sure that's where, where that lies. And then you just build very simple accompaniments around them based on the concepts of the modes we've talked about and all the different modes and the kind of the sound of the modes. Okay? Just keep all that in mind. And you will do fine as long as you remember you are not trying to be the big, boisterous leader when you're doing uh, psalm tone accompaniments. Okay? And, and so then the next question was about pedaling, and we can cover this pretty quickly because it's not, um, it's not that complex. Pedaling is a tool that you can use when you think it's appropriate. I, I, that's not much, that's, I know that's not much to go on, but you wouldn't always want to pedal in Gregorian chant accompaniment. For example, with a small group, uh, the pedal, a 16-foot pedal especially, might kind of um, drown them out a little bit. So if you've only got two or three guys singing, you might want to stay. And, and sometimes are a good a good way to look at this. Let's look at them. Uh, let's go back to the fourth antiphon in mode seven. If I only had one or two guys, it would be a bit excessive to do. Um, La -da -te -da -te -da -te -da. I mean that's a pretty big pretty big sound. It's really too big. It, it it's overpowering. I would keep it much simpler. Something more like. La -da -da -te -da. So I'm just on uh, a manual, and in fact on a manual with a, a, a quiet 8-foot um, flute and an 8-foot string, and that's it. Uh, one of the great great uses for pedals, though, is either with a large, large group or in alternatum when every other verse of something you want the congregation to sing. Uh, for or maybe um, your mixed choir joins in on the second uh, or on the alternating verses. So let's say like on the Kyrie from uh, Mass 11, your scola starts it. You might want to just stay on the swell with a quiet registration. Kyrie. Etc. 
So the pedaling really comes into play when you need a bigger sound. Uh, having that 16 foot in there helps kind of solidify the, the center of pitch, especially for a congregation who's not um, trained to sing a Gregorian chant. Uh, or if it's a large group and you just want that extra volume behind it to, to kind of build it up a little bit, that's fine. But when you're working with a small group or just a small scola, um, it's generally better actually to drop the pedal out because uh, it can drown things out. So that's really it. Um, in terms of what you play in the pedals, well, generally you're just going to play your, your, um, your bass note, your root note. Um, so if you're playing a Do major chord and Do is C, you're going to be playing a C in the pedal. center of pitch and mode, really, that the sense of mode to uh, a congregation or a large group. That's, I guess, all I would say about pedaling. And if you have any other questions about it, by all means, ask if you have something specific you're not sure about. But um, pedaling, keep it, uh, keep it reserved for particular applications and um, practice your psalm tones. It's good, good practice to sing along with them yourself uh, to get a feel for, for where they move and how they move. Um, and... Check out the links below if you want to see a little bit more about reading chant notation. And we'll be back uh, hopefully very soon with the next installment of Chant Talk. God bless you. <laughs>